Hi, this is Technical Tips from the Claris COVID Response Team Volunteers. Hi, welcome to the session. My name is Maka Inkarnasau and I'm a Senior Technical Project Lead at Salient Consulting. Been with Salient for about 13 years now, really love it there. And let's see, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico with my husband, my two little girls, and this little dude right here. <laughs> And I, um, let's see, I'm also co-founder of Join Table, which is a nonprofit I'll be talking about in this session. And last but not least, I, uh, one of the leads for Women Innovating Together. So let's jump right in. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about what is Join Table. Join Table is the combination of nonprofits who need filmmaker development help but can't really afford it on their own plus volunteers in the Claris community who are looking to donate their time to do pro bono work. And when you put those two things together, good things happen. So how does that work? So let's take a look at our website really quick. So if you take a look at jointable.org, you'll see that there is a place for contact. You have a way to sign up as a volunteer and to sign up as a nonprofit or school looking, looking for filmmaker help. So essentially you fill out the form as either party and then join table does the matchmaking. All right, so what is the Claire's COVID response team and what does it have to do with join table? Well, it started with Brad Freitag, CEO of Claris. Brad was inspired to leverage the Claris platform and its rapid development capabilities to quickly create technical solutions for new COVID-related needs. So what he did was uh, form together the Claris COVID response team to take in these requests, analyze them, and determine if they are a good fit for our platform and if they follow the requirements that uh, we were setting forth as, as the Claris COVID response team. The team comprised of uh, these two amazing women from Claris, Julie Sanfranius and Marie Norman. They were very much the driving force behind this team. They not only played the leadership role of this team in making sure things got done and progress was being made, but they also were handling all the licensing that was provided for free from Claris uh, for the organizations in need during the duration of this pandemic. So these two amazing women from Claris and Join Table is part of the Claris COVID response team. So myself and Chris Kubica and Jonathan Nicoletti, our role was basically uh, doing intake, helping determine determine if the project was should be eligible, and then assigning volunteers. So we would leverage our volunteers that signed up at jointable.org and assign them to projects. And then we also had Molly Colony, which was such a great resource in the community and knows a lot about everything. So she was definitely a helpful part of the team. And when things started to get pretty heavy and difficult, uh, we added to the team Jordan Watson and Mark Richman. So together we made the Claire's COVID response team. So who were these volunteers? They were just members of the Claire's community. You know, people... Just everyday people who knew about Claris and signed up at jointable.org. So I do want to take an opportunity to say thank you to these volunteers. I do want to point out that, you know, these are people who actually worked on projects. We actually had a, such a overwhelming response from the community, the Claris community, that we were not able to give everybody a project. So in order to visualize the data from all of our developer responses, Jonathan Nicoletti made this really cool interactive map where you, we can kind of see um, where, where are our volunteers coming from. And um, he even broke it down to, you know, hours per month. So you can see like the massive amount of hours that our volunteers have pledged. And some partners, we can see how many partners we have pledged. So you can see it's, it's a lot of partner hours as well. And finally, uh, just how many partners total have pledged. Really great response from the community. We were really blown away at how generous everyone was during this and how eager people are to really participate in this fight against the pandemic. So a couple of these I do want to call out. First one I want to call is Aline from Vehicle Media. Uh, we had a request come in from Paris, France, a dentist from Paris. 
And he basically had a homegrown app that he built himself, but he just needed some some help, some guidance to make it possible for other medical practices in France to be able to use the same app. And what that app really did was a triage app where essentially a customer would fill out a form and say, you know, this is um, this is my issue. Then a doctor would analyze that form and say, is this a medical emergency or not? Do we need to make some allowances for this person to be seen, and then who can I assign to this uh, medical emergency? Uh, vehicle media. They're from Canada, so they spoke French. That was awesome <laughs> to be able to match, you know, the same language. And then also they were really generous of their time and ended up donating over 500 hours of work to help the dentist in France. So it was really put in a lot of work to complete that project, which was awesome. Another volunteer I want to point out is, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, but Shweta from Metasystem Software. Metasystem Software is a partner in India. The interesting thing about this group is that we had we had several requests come in from India, and they were the only partner from India that we had signed up to volunteer. And I think at one point it was like three or four requests came in and they were just willing to do it all. I was just really blown away of their generosity of their time. And I guess the kind of ironic thing is that none of those projects actually panned out. They're just their generosity was really mind blowing and I would love to meet them one day because they were extremely nice. The other people I wanted to point out is is Susan Prosser and David Head. They were amazing with building documentation for our documenters. So at one point we realized we were we were completing these apps and they were to a point where we could hand them off to other needs that came in. So other organizations that had similar struggles, you know, we would have either a starting point app or a completely finished app that we could just hand over. And we realized like they, they're going to need some instruction on how to use this and, and what to do about it. So we we decided to assign documentation volunteers to actually create some documentation for these completed apps. And so what, what Susan Prosser uh, and David Head did is they essentially created documentation for the documenters. So we have like a consistent format. Things were not uh, left out. So it, it was really great working with them. So yeah, let's uh, look at some of the projects that we'll, that we'll be talking about in this track specifically. So in this track, you'll see a little mini session from Dr. Fine, Dr. Brian Fine, and he'll be, t he'll be demoing his Nimble texting app. And he had a lot of help from Barbara Cooney from Geist, and I, and I think a couple other people from Geist uh, really helped him, and, or I think they helped him with the hosting too. So that was his volunteer team. This group of smart young people here, uh, Marangela and Bruno and Natalia, they are Italian Apple Academy students. And so interesting about this app is that Marangela's mother is a nurse and she was basically just blown away by the amount of pay paperwork her mother had to do during COVID. So they decided to band together and create an app for the hospital that her mother works at. And so Giuseppe is essentially like a mentor. So it was nice to get to get a volunteer from Italy to help them out, to guide them when they got stuck. So you'll learn more about that app. Um, we also have Nathan and Danielle from Codence are going to talk about their, their app, Community Health Log. So you'll learn more about that. And Sarah Beat from Solus Digital is going to talk about the app that she helped create, which is a critical stock inventory app that is used in WebDirect uh, in London for the ambulances to track their inventory. So you'll learn about that. Steve Gleason is going to talk a lot about the Blackboard project. It is a contact tracing app. And uh, finally, Graham Young is going to talk about an inventory tracking app that he built for a major city, major U.S. city. And Graham is a fellow Slant employee. So Graham from Slant. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little tiny quick tr trick that is from this app. So this is the app for the... Uh, inventory tracking that Graham Young built and you know before we put it in our repository I wanted to put a little something to just say you know if 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 a city got this app how would they know to contact the client um, you know just a little a little info a little quick way to get some reference so 
This is a, a good trick for demo files. I know Solent uses this in our demo files as well. So it just kind of, I thought it was a cool little trick. And actually, I learned about it from our demo file, which was added from Mike Duncan. So he wrote a blog post about it and he added it to our demo file. So um, first, let me show you what the trick is. So if I click on this about, you see this little uh, thing slides in and out. So I'll close it, open it. So I just think it's neat. It looks like it looks like it's sliding in. So how am I doing that? So let's take a look. Actually, what I might do is just open it in the script debugger. Tool script debugger. And let's click on it and see what happens. So set object animation on. Um, I have a little pause because it was not showing up if I didn't pause. It was like too fast uh, to see the actual slide in there. And then so the panel, you can see that there's basically a slide panel in there. So I have a go to object and um, it opens that object. And then I check my direction if I'm closing or opening. And now, so now if I close it again, we can take a look what that looks like. Oh, it'll do this one. So set animation on, go to object uh, info number one. So you can see this is a little um, slide panel and it's a slide panel within a popover. And so you open the popover first and then you change the slide panel. So all this is doing when I close is it goes to object number one, which is a, a clear panel, and then close the popover, and that's it, and it's done. So I'll show you really quick what this looks like in here. So if I click on this, you can see my object here, you can see my buttons. It's a clear popover with a slide panel on top of it, and then when I go to the other side, it, it is it shows my little message. And I can, of course, hide these. So if I was to hide them, so I'm gonna take this off so you don't you don't see those navigation buttons. So it looks a little better. And then this button here is the actual popover part, which is, of course, hidden. So just a cool little uh, trick. The other thing that is interesting here is I also added about through a custom menu. So if you know if they're not on the screen, because I don't have this button on every screen, so if I go to a different screen, you don't see that button anymore. But if um, I added this about, and so that's another way for them to get some information about Salient or who created this app just through the card window. All right, that's my little trick. On to the next one. Thanks for coming by. Hello, my name is Brian Fine, uh, and I am a physician, and I have been a part of the Claris COVID relief team. Um, and I want to start by saying thank you to Claris for the support um, of Percentric specifically, but also the community at large uh, at this time of great need. There's been so much going on, and I don't think you um, can easily appreciate uh, how how much it means to any one individual um, to see support from community at large and organizations. Um, I also want to say thank you specifically to the Geist group, um, Todd, Dave, Barbara. Um, thank you for your support um, as a partner. Um, Maka, thank you for your support from the very outset. Um, Julie as well, uh, a big part of what we've been trying to accomplish for the last few months. Um, and I'd also like to make a shout out to a handful of other FileMaker partners who have helped uh, sort of outside of the scope of the Claris COVID relief program. Um, Mike, Andrew, Michael, um, I really appreciate everything you guys have done. Um, with that being said, I'm going to sort of jump into Nimble, which is the sort of rebranded name formerly Percy MD. Uh, I am not a video expert, uh, nor am I a FileMaker expert, but I am not a video expert, so I'm going to do my best here to sort of walk you through some of the features and see if there's something that you guys would find of value uh, as part of the Claris Engage initiative coming up. Thank you so much. 
So I'm going to do my best to show you the core features of the software. Um, kind of in one go, I've tried this a few times and I just want to give you a sense. So we come to a, um, obviously a dashboard page. It's got active uh, you know, patients that I would be working with. Um, obviously I've got more uh, patients that are inactive as well who I can add if I want to. Um, and then again, these are the active patients that I'm working with. And so let's say I'm going to go ahead and add, and there's ways to get the information if the patient writes first, but just to make this as simple as possible for demonstration, um, I'm going to go ahead and put in, and you commit, and this allows me to choose to keep them active if I wanted to. And then as a physician, there's going to be some demographic information that I'm going to want. Um, and so I'll go ahead, and now it brings up Brian Fine right here, and I can go ahead and this is the chart page and I can go ahead and send Brian a little message that says okay well good morning how are you doing it fills in his name and there we go so now Brian Fine one of my patients has heard from his doctor and there is the message that would happen on his phone so Brian can respond I'm doing great doc and let's start there so again normally a patient would be reaching out and saying hey what's going on I have an issue but for illustrative purposes here I have it a little workaround I have a little green indicator here to go ahead and refresh and that brings up I'm doing great doc at which point I can go ahead and do something like get consent which would be something like that you know SMS is okay and so that's where the patient so the patient might consent this way and patients absolutely love texting high 90% when I ask people would you rather text or use any other platform they just they want text period end of story so again I would bring that in here and then I can go ahead and if I wanted to I've got let's just say and I'm gonna speed this up there's some COVID questions that somebody might get and they will answer them obviously texting is not for emergencies um, but let's say no to all except my mom has a co-worker with a brother with COVID. Yep, that's the kind of stuff that we're seeing. You know, people are scared uh, all over the place. So now we've got this in exchange between. And so uh, just to go through some of the features, some of the things that we can do here is I can write myself an internal note that says, spoke to Brian by phone. And this goes ahead and it incorporates the note within the chronological thread of the notes themselves and then if I wanted to sort of just filter by let's say the specifics so blue being outgoing green being incoming I'm going ahead and I can do that this would be everybody going there if I wanted to give myself a little to-do list on Brian so Brian needs a prescription let's say um, I can go ahead and do that and now back on the main page Brian is there you'll notice this one is in black because the last message which is what's showing up on this screen is uh, this note it doesn't have the green or the blue now I have this other view that I've built in here which um, allows me to manipulate the information a little bit so here's a box of stuff that I want to see every time that Brian so I want to know let's say for example okay I'm gonna put SMS is okay all right, and then let's go ahead and I'm going to say good morning. I'll, I'll just put these two in there. And we'll go ahead and have a little internet thing here. But they show up here in this box. And good morning, Brian. How are you doing? And again, they do. They sort of auto populate. And they're going to stay there no matter what. Because every single time that I come into the chart, I want to see a few things. And this might be, for example, the pharmacy that they use or something like that. I also have a little built in where I can go ahead and put stuff down there and edit it if I want. So I could just click the little person here. I'm doing great, Doc. And, you know, good to here. So now I've got some documentation there. But more importantly, as a doctor, what I want is I want to be able to create episodes of care. So I come over here and let's go ahead and add a new episode for a COVID exposure. And so now we've started an episode of care and it's brought up these extra boxes here. And this stands for Chief Concern Subjective Objective Assessment Plan. We just use it in medicine, but you could of course use it for any issue that somebody has where it is brought to the attention. What is your main concern? 
give me the subjective. So I'm concerned that I'm sick. Give me the subjective details. Well, I've been sick for three days. Uh, I don't like uh, the taste of this. I can't smell anything. Objectively, what exam findings, assessment, what do I think's going on and plan, what am I going to do about it? So what I've done now here, as you can imagine, SMS okay, I want to know that all the time. But regarding COVID, that might only want to be classified as a subjective and then maybe an assessment and maybe a plan. So when I go in, and we'll go ahead and put uh, this as chief complaint. Um, so if I click on chief complaint, it brings that bubble over just for this episode. If I bring subjective, and again, I can bring any of them over into this space so that now I've got I'm just, I don't have to redo work. Uh, I can incorporate everything within the very thread uh, of the conversation itself. Um, the other neat feature that we have is that as I'm working with each of my patients, um, I want to work with them over several days, but I also want to know each given day if I've finished working with them. So I don't need to get in touch with them again until tomorrow, let's say. So that's where we built it. And that zero right there, that, re that represents that Brian has an episode that's zero days old. Now, let's say I'm done with Brian for the day. I'm not going to write his prescription. I'm going to block him off and I'm going to sort of mark off the people that I'm done with. And then if I refresh, it brings a couple of guys to the top, so marks my folks down there at the bottom. But then let's say I go ahead and I finish, and now I'm done for the day. Gives me a little indicator there, thumbs up. All right, so I don't have to worry. There's no patient issue that's lingering for today that I need to go ahead and get in touch with. But then tomorrow morning, I gotta start over again. And I gotta think about each person again. Now, Dave, I might not need to get in touch with again today. And I would think, well, should I just close him out of the system um, or no? Um, and again, so I can go through here, then maybe with Todd, okay, sure, you know what, I'm actually going to go ahead, and he doesn't have anything open, so I'm going to close him out, uh, Brian, um, yeah, I'm going to keep him in there, so then when I refresh, you'll notice that Todd is gone. And so it's a way to do actual action on this dashboard, um, where you can make them active or otherwise to do and sort of daily complete, but then you also can go into the chart, and then using web viewers and other sort of technical stuff. We also can send and receive files. Um, we just have a way of doing patient care by text message. Hi, I'm Mariangela. I'm 23 years old and I'm from southern Italy, one of the countries most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We were one of the first countries facing the lockdown. So to cope with this emergency, my teammates and I decided to build a project that would have a positive impact on our affected community. While home, I was able to see the difficulties my mom was encountering during her work. She's a nurse of the home care department at the San Severo Public Hospital and she manages other 23 nurses. Italian health system was highly hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, having consequences also on the departments that were not meant to be for the cure of the virus, like the home care department. So the contagion risks made incre increasing the, the request for the home care services. And this aggravated all the pain points that were already present. I met my teammates and friends during my two years at the Apple Developer Academy and uh, we, we learned there uh, how to investigate a problem to find meaningful solutions. We are a diverse group. We come from different backgrounds, from engineering to medicine to computer science. We decided to focus all of our experiences and knowledge in this project, Farmadi. Farmadi facilitates the request and the managing of the warehouse of the home care department, taking consideration the, emergency, the COVID emergency. Well before the request of the nurses for the materials and the medicines for, uh, from the hospital uh, needed to be made in person in the hospital. Now, thanks to Farmadi, they can uh, make this, this request only via the system, reducing the face-to-face -face meetings and eliminating the contagion risks. So everything in Farmadi is digitalized 
from the request to the managing, management of the medicine, the materials, the requests. Everything has an history on it and it will always be available. Now, let's dive into the app. As a nurse, I will have my unique username and password that will allow me to enter my personal space into Pharmadi, where I history all of my requests will be always available. From here, I can manage those requests, see if they have been approved by the manager and know when I could go to the hospital for receiving the materials and medicines needed for the procedures I'm assigned to perform for that month. From here, I can also start a new request. The system will automatically calculate all I need based on the procedures that will, I will need to perform. All I have to do is press on Add Performances, select the ones I'm assigned to and specify how many to, uh, for each of them. The app also takes in consideration the various measures for each material when available and easily I will be able to specify it. Once added all the performances and details, I will have a prospect of all the materials I'm going to request. But Farmadi also takes in consideration my professional liberty. That's why I'm also able to add medicine and materials independently from performances. Also in this case, specifying measures and quantity. Farmadi, for all the requests, will take in consideration the materials I already have to my disposal from previous requests and never used, automatically subtracting them from the new request. This way the hospital can be sure to avoid waste. Once completed, I can easily send, securely, my request to the hospital. Also the manager will have his own credentials into Farmadi. Once logged in, the manager will be able to perform multiple tasks. Manage the users on the system when new nurses join or leave the home care department, taking track of the materials and medicines available on his disposal. And moreover, evaluate all the nurses' requests and based on those making an order to the hospital's pharmacy to, to satisfy the nurses' requests. Let's start from the letter. On this page, the manager can look at all the requests from the nurses, ordered by date. When a new request arrives, like the one I sent earlier, the managers can look at it in details. Here, we can decide to approve all the materials requests or to be more selective and approve only some of them. Once decided and approved the items, the manager can, in orders page, open a new order to send to the hospital pharmacy. Here he will be able to add to the list the items needed, both adding them from the nurse's request previously approved or more freely adding them from a general list. When we click on add from request, all the items approved from the nurse's request will be present in the draft of this new order. Farmadi will calculate automatically the items the manager will need to order from the pharmacy based on the materials and medicines already in storage. Hi, my name is Nathan Allen and I am a technical lead at Codence and I want to take some time to give you a brief overview of our community health log application. Back in early March, due to a rising concern around COVID-19, we were approached by an existing client to create a solution to help them track the movement of employees between their various campuses. To accomplish this, we constructed a simple database to store check-in data for employees and developed an auxiliary database in FileMaker Go to assist their security guards in checking employees in and out at each campus entrance. When Claris approached us about submitting a solution that would potentially be a help to other organizations during this time, we requested permission to further develop this solution. We knew we wanted to add some additional features beyond scanning and data storage, so we focused on enhancing the interface, the data collection method, 
reporting, and data visualization. We wanted a clean, flexible interface, and we wanted to incorporate a master detail layout style. We wanted the design and colors to illustrate the flow of data from big picture to individual detail. For instance, on the location and staff detail screens, you can see how we started with a darker shade of gray and we go lighter as we go from left to right, naturally directing the focus to the record details. For data collection, we knew that for many organizations, having a dedicated individual check in people at each campus entrance would not be feasible. So instead, we worked on developing a user driven system for collecting the check in data. Since we didn't want to require installation of FMGo or limit its use to a single platform, we decided to make this a web-based solution. Since 2017, both iOS and Android have had native support for QR codes in their camera app, and as such, we decided to utilize a unique QR code per location, which would open that custom web app connected to our FileMaker solution via the FileMaker Data API. The web code that we provide in the app is written in PHP and contains a very simple UI built on Bootstrap 4.4. The process for setting this up is fairly straightforward with all of the connection settings contained within a single configuration file named config.php. The default interface for the web app contains the company logo, a call out to indicate the location the scan will be recorded to, and a drop down to select which staff member is checking in at that time. With some basic PHP edits, you could further customize it. Uh, you could perhaps filter the staff dropdown to only show staff members that are marked as active or staff members only at a certain location. Once a staff member is selected and the form submitted, the entry is recorded in FileMaker and a join record is created between staff and location. Once we have the user submitted data, we can now graph that data and accurately report which staff may have had potential exposure with someone else. To do this, the first thing you need to do is set a reporting range. This filters the exposure graph to pinpoint exposure within a specific window of time. By default, this window is set to 14 days, but that number can be adjusted in settings. Let's go to Vanessa's record here, and we'll backdate this a bit and say that our start date is 323 of 2020, and our end date is 45 2020, assuming the date is 45 2020 currently. And let's pretend Vanessa has reported that she was exposed to COVID-19 and that that exposure event took place three days prior. First, we'll add the new health event into the system by navigating to the Log Entry tab and selecting the New Log Entry button and filling in the appropriate details. Now, when we go back and filter the graph, we can use the data presented here to guide us in who else may need to be tested or perhaps work from home during a given period. The primary purpose of this graph is to gauge the probability of exposure and help reach out to others within your organization proactively. To help visualize this data in another manner, we've also incorporated the Google Maps API into the solution. By visiting the dashboard, we can view a heat map showing where users have checked in. The scan data can be further filtered to only show scans for staff reporting a health event within the current reporting window or date range. For those developers that are new to the data API, I know it can be a bit overwhelming learning a new syntax and structure for creating your queries to FileMaker. And so to help keep our web code simple and familiar, we use the FMPDA PHP class developed by Driftwood Interactive. This tool is a great solution for developers with new or existing solutions that want to take advantage of the FileMaker data API, but may be hesitant to learn a new format and method for building your web connections. Thank you for taking the time to watch this, and we hope this solution can be a help to you during this unique time. In this short presentation, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to our organization, who we are, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you how Solace Digital responded to COVID-19 within the first few weeks of the pandemic. I'm also going to share with you some tips and techniques that we used and found real success in. And who knows, maybe you might think of implementing some of these in your next solution. So to start off with, let me introduce myself. My name is Sarah Beat, and I am the solution architect for Solace Digital. I'm also the product owner of the app that we will be presenting in this video. So as I said, I'm part of the team at Solace Digital where it is our aim and mission to unlock the power of technology for your business by translating 
intricate business processes into effective and highly efficient software. As a team, we focus on getting large enterprise companies to innovate by updating software, optimizing business processes, and enhancing their customer experience. We have a long, rich history with enterprise organizations, in particular, the NHS sector. During the pandemic, we had multiple NHS trusts in the UK reaching out to us directly. We had actually been working on previous Claire's projects together, and it's because of those relationships that they knew they could reach out to us because we had been credible in the space for a long time. When they were looking for a safe and scalable solution to be implemented quickly and to respond to COVID-19, they knew they were in safe hands. Our rapid application response to COVID-19 was to build a solution that would allow them to track personal protective equipment, or PPE, in real time across multiple locations in the tens and thousands of devices and users. In response to their request, we provided an end-to-end -end solution that the team worked extremely hard on, working nearly 24 hours a day for nearly two weeks. This is basically from the initial conception to the first rollout release, we built what we call the Critical Stock Manager. The Critical Stock Manager solution allows healthcare trusts and organizations to gain an overview of all their PPE while managing stock locations and setting alerts and being able to do then forward forecasting. They can monitor stock takes and track live stock with speed and accuracy and all of this from one simple cloud-based app. This app was available on the, on the iPhone, the iPad and desktop devices. The Critical Stock Manager application has provided life-saving information by putting the power and control of tracking PPU equipment back in the hands of ambulance services and medical trusts across the entire UK. Now, after hearing about all the stuff that the Critical Stock Manager can do, it'd probably be nice to hear a little bit about how did we do it. So I'm going to kind of run through several of the different problems that were presented to us and then share with you how we managed to find a solution. I'm going to include both some tips and some tricks, and if you ever want to discuss any of this project more, please feel free to reach out to anyone in our team. So we'll start with the first problem. The solution was designed and deployed to run via WebDirect, and we needed a way to track the users along with their logins to try to effortlessly, and I'm kind of doing that in some virtual air quotes, to keep users logged in and to have like minimal interruption. Our solution was to code into the app a kind of cookie function. Here we'd use the persistent ID of each logged in user and retain the, a log of their access. This really worked a treat and it was set up in a way to emulate a cookie on a machine and it allowed the app to remember all of the user's details. All of the trusts reported that they needed to see live stock levels fast. Not only did they need to see this across their sectors, but also at a granular level, say at like a fleet level or ambulance level. And all this information was gonna be reported to their internal teams. And the whole point was that they were gonna be able to spot critical stock levels and at a fast pace and respond with accurate stock transfers in order to support the growing pandemic hotspots. As a solution, we came up with the idea of not only displaying and reporting these numbers in a table or graph, but we used a heat map technique and this would visually direct the NHS teams so that they can see the areas of importance. It's what we call a visual call to action. The graph utilizes custom JavaScript functionality, and we were able to tailor this to each trust, allowing us to report in areas, sectors, regions, and at fleet levels all very dynamically. The next problem we faced was the need to have access and views of PP stock levels from many different locations. For instance, the setup would call for access at both a warehouse, on the ground, um, with clinicians, at, in ambulances. And there was also a need for an overarching manager view that would allow us to live report and for the ability also to override any data submissions. We solved this problem by utilizing Claris's WebDirect capabilities and creating a user-friendly and function-specific screens available across iPhones, iPads, and desktop and supported the deployment across several sites and over 10,000 devices. We created a web clip and deployed via MDM, which allowed us to create a personalized logo without us having to compile a full SDK. 
Another hurdle we face is how are we going to manage these multiple installations? With the development cycle that was happening so quickly, we needed a way to schedule and automate installations and upgrades with a live environment that had an extremely small window of downtime. We actually utilize a tool by Geiss Interactive called Auto to manage all of our installation. This is a tool that we have been using internally for a while, and it helps to mitigate risks around incorrect versions being distributed. It helped our team really to plan better and eliminated any of the human factor mistakes that could happen. And really, the most amazing part is it does migrations in a matter of seconds. It's truly an awesome tool. With the CSM app being installed in so many NHS trusts, you might imagine that some of these trusts had different specifications or required special configurations. And you'd be right. Managing all these bespoke configurations could have easily become overwhelming. So we actually implemented a settings area so that NHS teams could manage the things like logos or their app name if they so wish to choose to pick a different one. Uh, they could apply notifications and bulk settings of stock warning levels. It even included an area where they can manage their own manager level access. This really opened the door and allowed trust to make the app their own and mold it into a solution that fit their environment without having to submit countless support queries to our team, which in turn allowed us to focus on enhancing the critical stock manager app as the pandemic continued to evolve. Each trust had multiple sites and locations and each location had numerous fleets and they were covering all of London. To manage access to the app, we needed to find a way to create and distribute safe and secure access to the mobile versions of the app that could be updated at any moment. To solve this problem, we implemented an, and automated the generation of a PIN code for their identified locations within the app. If there was ever any worry about access information, at a touch of a button, managers could regenerate a code and instantly share this new access information within their teams. Finally, with all this live moving and tracking of data, we knew performance of the app was key. We pushed any of the processing that was possible back from the app back onto the server so that the user wouldn't see any delay. The solution was all about response and the performance of the app had to match accordingly. This app had to work faster than each frontline worker if it was going to be a success. This app gave people on the front line the peace of mind that PPE stock was being tracked and monitored on a live basis. The best outcome that we could have ever hoped for was in a reference from one of the chief clinical information officers, in which where he said, the app has enabled us to continue to support our frontline staff and therefore the care for the patients of London. For us at Solace Digital, there could truly be no greater outcome. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Steve Gleason. I'm with Gleason Solutions, LLC. I'm an independent FileMaker developer. I live in the western suburbs of Chicago, and I've been using Claros products for over 20 years, most of which I spent in Chicago's advertising industry. I transitioned from being an in-house citizen developer to full-time development work in 2016. I've earned every available developer certification since then, and I've been an active part of our local development community with my own group of clients and also partnering with other developers. In my personal life, I live in a very flat state, so bike riding is very attractive. I also cook a good deal and enjoy playing and buying way too many guitars. I've been fortunate to have an opportunity to work on several pro bono projects lately. It's been a great way to give back to the community while continuing to grow as a developer. I worked on two different teams as part of the Claris COVID-19 response team, and I'm going to talk about one of those projects today. We all have things to offer each other, and in my experience, everyone wants to consider their contributions to be valuable and meaningful. The organization that we partnered with on this project helps new and recent immigrants find ways to contribute to our society in ways that are significant, essential, and so worthy of our respect. Resilience Force provides training and placement and performs public policy and advocacy efforts, finding opportunities for recent immigrants to provide vital assistance in times of natural emergency or national crisis. Resilience Force's board contacted the Claris COVID-19 response team to ask for help with establishing a program for contact tracing. 
This helps alert people when they've been in contact with other people who have tested positive for the coronavirus. I worked with a team from Thorson Consulting, Molly Connolly and Seth Zurer, and met with the board of Resilience Force. They have systems in place already for bringing workers into their system and for training and tracking the training. They're still determining the best way of tracking worker time and assignment, their compensation, and gathering performance feedback. So what we determined our initial deliverable would be is a hub where we could match worker skill sets and locations to client organizations' needs. This is an early stage build of a work in progress. And here's a quick walkthrough. One of the things that we like to do when we're creating an app for a client is to brand it for them. Uh, that usually involves naming it and also providing a custom icon. In this case, playing off the word resilience, we came up with the name for the app Backboard. Backboard has three different sections, one for the workers or volunteers, one for the placement assignments, and one for the case workers who, is, who are assigned to those workers or, or locations. In the case of the workers, we track things like their placements, um, a biography, any notes that we have, uh, any training information that we have on them, photos or documents that support. Um, creating a new worker is pretty straightforward. We just collect their demographic information. We identify a caseworker who's assigned to them. We add different contacts and priorities for those contacts. And then we list different skills that that person might have. Uh, we can then search based on location or based on skill set. In this case, I'm going to do a search based on uh, Ohio. And we found one person, Graciela, who has these skills available. So uh, we have a list of different placements that she has and when they started and ended. If we go on to the placements or assignments, we can see a listing of all the placements that were used by an organization, a list of their locations, a list of their contacts, a list of notes and or issues, and whether those notes or issues have been resolved, whether there's a follow-up that's required. You can also attach photos and documents, and each of those have a preview that's available. And then finally, for the case workers, it's a very similar master detail look to the, um, to the worker assignment. And this one, again, just lists different assignments who are assigned to this case worker, different workers who are assigned to the case worker, and any notes, photos, or documents that are related to that case worker. Under the hood, we've kept things very intuitive and very simple. The table names are all very straightforward. The field names use a very consistent naming convention. And the graph also is very easy to read using a standard anchor buoy method, reading left to right, color coded, and using a clear naming convention so you know where you are in the graph. Here's some other considerations about Backboard. We may or may not be working on this project in the future, depending on both our availability and Resilience Force's needs. So we want to make sure that any foundational work that we do is easily understood by any other developer who might work on the project in the future. It also means that we don't want to overreach. We don't want to introduce any features that will be difficult for other developers to support. And we want to ensure that any features that are more complex would have a real value for the organization. For example, there are Google API integrations and JavaScript tools that would help Resilience Force identify volunteers for specific assignments. The Google Maps API can identify GPS information based on addresses, and we could also identify travel times and possibly public transportation costs. This could help determine whether a specific assignment was viable for a specific volunteer, and it could provide meaningful information that could help them fine tune their efforts in identifying both volunteers and assignments. One other consideration is, as a small virtual organization, Resilience Force doesn't have dedicated IT resources. So Seth Zurer on our team uh, set up a FileMaker Cloud instance and trained them on how to admin their own files. 
we've made every effort to make the file itself intuitive and self-explanatory. The app works with minimal differences across FileMaker Pro, FileMaker Go, and in WebDirect on a browser. Resilience Force is still putting together their response team. Our app will be a solid starter solution for them and a foundation for further rapid application development. I found this project rewarding. I encourage other developers at all levels to find projects that they can contribute to in their community. Thanks. Hi, my name is Graham Young. I'm a FileMaker developer working for Saliant Consulting. And this is a inventory management app that we developed to help with COVID response. So it's a basic inventory management system um, that tracks donations and distributions of COVID um, related items. So uh, we set up a admin section which allows the users to set up some preferences. They can um, set up different categories and subcategories of items, um, depending on what uh, type of item they're receiving or distributing. Um, there's a, a table of organizations who are making um, these uh, donations and a list of users and some other preferences for their logos and uh, email preferences. Um, the app itself um, has tables for sources um, of the distributions and um, donations, also the items themselves. So this is a table of unique items that are being tracked. Um, we also set up a ticketing system um, so that as um, people uh, come in to the warehouse or different um, locations that um, people are tracking, they can um, track those. That was originally done on paper. Um, we changed that to a mobile app and allowed them to create a ticket that would um, allow them to enter that information um, more quickly and effectively. The transactions are the unique line items for each ticket. So if somebody makes a donation, it would track you know, what the donation was. And if those then got distributed to somebody who needed that, they would track those as well. So um, if somebody in the warehouse, for example, um, was doing an intake, they would fire up the mobile app, um, whether it's on um, iOS uh, using FileMaker Go, or um, using WebDirect on a non-iOS device. Um, they could just do, for example, a new intake, which would you know, walk them through picking you know, who the source was, um, you know, what the packet slip number was, who was doing the donation, um, maybe add some notes. Click Next. That would allow them to then uh, add a new item, which would again, walk them through the different categories uh, and allow them to drill down and say, okay, I got maybe 10 boxes and there's you know 30 per box. They could also add photos um, so that they could um, refer to that later and then save it. So um, if they were then done with that ticket, they could submit it, which would notify um, a user using the desktop app. They could also save it for later um, and go back and modify it and just select the one that they were working on. Once they do submit it, that would generate a, a PDF receipt for them, which would be emailed um, from the server using perform script on server and also notify the um, administrators that the ticket had been submitted. They could also use the mobile app to uh, make a distribution, which would got them through a very similar process. Um, they could also just do a quick check of how many of a particular item they have on hand at any given time. So all that was very useful um, to uh, get rid of all the paper they were using to track that and also have a kind of real-time information that they could see on a dashboard type of situation. Um, they could also see uh, different metrics um, based on you know, date range. So that would basically query the transactions that happened and kind of give them a quick uh, top-level view of how they were doing both with distributions and um, intake information. They could also see um, the tickets and their status. So if something was complete, they could take a you know, quick look at it um, and approve it or um, see if there's uh, any issues. So all that was um, a big help to them just logistically and 
as far as eliminating a lot of duplication of effort and at the same time giving kind of high level information at a glance to uh, people who need it. Thanks so much.